Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this morning's pottery demonstration with Robert and Patricio. My name is Lilia McEnany, and I am an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture Laboratory of Anthropology. So for those of you who are familiar with MIAC and our programming will know that pre-pandemic, we regularly hosted monthly pottery demonstrations in our Buxbaum Gallery. And even though we are now open to the public, we are continuing our pottery demonstration series on Zoom. Um, and so stay tuned for details on upcoming demonstrations and other programs by following our Facebook page and signing up for our monthly newsletter. Before I hand it over to Robert, a few quick things. Um, so to begin, I would like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are in a virtual space, um, and at least on my end, we are in Ogopoge today within the Tewo world. As a non-Native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewo people, and I wish to acknowledge all of the Indigenous communities, Pueblo, Diné, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward these places. And I would encourage everyone watching here today to reflect on their own position to the lands on which they reside. So in discussing his practice, Robert Patricio tells us, um, quote, the pottery inspires me to keep going, keeping the tradition alive and making pottery, that's how we were brought up. Our ancestors started making pottery, it's amazing what comes from a piece of clay. And when you come to Acoma, it's peaceful and quiet. And when you look at a piece of pottery, you feel that same peacefulness. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Robert. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Lilia, thank you for that introduction. Um, Good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you uh, came to, um, to the Zoom party, I guess I should say, <laughs> for my demonstration on the on pottery. Um, I really don't like to be serious, so I'll probably be joking around, of course, and that's me, myself, but um, I'm here to demonstrate um, how to make Akuma pottery. Of course, there's a lot of us that do make Akuma pottery. Um, here on the reservation or off the reservation, but a lot of us do use um, uh, traditional clay. Um, we use traditional clay, we use traditional pottery shards. Um, most of the stuff that we use um, are found around on the bottom of the village. Um, stuff that, um, all the stuff that I'm going to show you today is um, like um, I have my tools here. I have uh, mines aren't boards. Mines are um, mines are are wooden tools that I made myself, um, and some of them that I have in my box are um, given to me like from my my mom, my dad that um, that they they, they used um, to um, quite a while and. Of course, like my paddle boards, I make my own paddle boards. So, one of the tools that um, that people use are like uh, uh, these kind of tools that you find um, at, at New Mexico clay, and these are still useful. I mean, either way, same same way as uh, the wood ones that I made myself. Um, and of course, um, you know, we mentioned some of us mentioned. Uh, Made lids that we use for scraping. I use skull lids. Um, I don't chew skull, but I use for skull lids to scrape. Um, and I use a lot. I I'm, I think I'm talking a little bit loud, but um, if um, you can't hear me, um, I'm sorry. I have to set up in here in my living room. Um, usually, when I do make pottery, I make pottery on my dining room table. I don't have um, I don't have my own um, showroom that I make pottery in, but um, I had to set up in here and I hope you like my setup. Um, we kind of decided to show a little bit of pottery um, that I made already recently uh, for the past two weeks. Um, I um, put out some pottery from my grandma to my aunties to my mom, um, which I'll talk about that later. But um, what I want to do is um, um, I want to go ahead and show you the process of, um, of making um, Acoma pottery. Um, I know a lot of us already showed, you know, how to do it with, with the, the coil method. 
um, coil method, and then of course um, our traditional Fujitsu bows. Um, most of the ones that we have are um, my sisters. My sisters are the ones that claim claim the the bows. So I made my own with um, traditional clay. So this is some of the ones that I made. Um, I have one that um, that was given to me, but um, it's somewhere in the bucket. Um, but usually that's what I use. Um, sometimes I use some. Um, let's see. I put a. I put. A, I actually use another bowl. It's a regular bowl, and I put a rag in it. And what I do, the reason why I put a rag is to keep it wet and moist in, moist from the bowl, so it doesn't get dry. Because once you make in this style, what it does is that it, it absorbs all the water. So once you set the the piece of clay in it, um, it, it just gets um, set right away. So once it's set, there's not really a, a way you can push the clay out on the bottom. But right now, um, as I was growing up doing uh, doing pottery, um, I was making 20 pots a day. I know most of you guys aren't going to believe that I make 20 pots a day, but I, I used to make 20 pots a day as I was growing up. Um, I started um, at the age of nine and um, just started doing small little pottery, um, small little uh, miniature pots, and I used to just sell them up at the um, at old Acoma and fell into the tourists that come up, come around. And, but uh, most of the time it was just um, selling them for like $5, $2, um, a dollar, just, um, just to get some money to go buy a soda pop or a bag of chips or gum. Um, and sometimes snow cones, if, if somebody ever sold snow cones at the old village. But I was raised up there at the old village um, ever since um, I turned 17. Um, at the age of 17, I moved back down with my parents. Um, and then my parents moved back up. My parents moved back up to the old village um, Sometime during, sometime during um, when I went back to, when I went back to high school and they, they ended up moving back up to Acma. So um, when they moved back up, um, we, we went back up there to, to stay with them, you know, over the weekends. But when I come back from school, I went to San Fernando school. So when I came back from school, what I was doing was making small little um, jars. And the reason why I was doing that was just to get some money to, to spend going back up to school um, at the end of the school. And which, um, which I guess was uh, a good idea for me because <laughs> um, I was never given money from my parents and I won't ask for, for anything, but as I, as I was growing up, you know, just at least I'll have some, some cash with me all the time. But other than that, um, coil methods, I, I do a coil method. I roll, get the ball of clay and I just throw my coil out. Um, don't use a machine, which uh, I know a lot of people say, you know, man, he must have a machine. So, and I wish I did have a machine in the OB and back of my shed, so making pottery for me, but I don't have a machine. In. The 
just the process of um, how I make my iron. And early in the mornings when I'm, when I'm making pottery, um, when the kids, of course, are asleep, so they wake up early. And I'm over here banging away, and waking them up and telling them. And then they get up and they say, what are you doing? As I'm making, uh, making pottery. So, which is pretty funny because my kids are always saying, you're working this early and you're waking everybody up. So I usually get up early, try to start early, but sometimes when I don't start early, it uh, the day goes by really fast. And I did a few demos um, in the past. And um, I know... Uh, some of the demos that I did, it showed you know, how I grind the clay, um, how I mix the clay. And it's all the same process. Everybody uses the same process. There's nothing different from making acma pottery. Um, you know, you have your own process, however you were taught, um, however, you know, whatever you want to use of tools or um, if you want to use different bowls or make different shapes, you know, that's just up to the artist. Um, I'm, I like making the, the big holes. As you can see in the back, these are the, some of the big holes that I, that I like to make. Uh, most of the times, you know, I'll make seed pods. Sometimes I'll make seed pods, sometimes I'll make wedding bases. Um, or uh, canteens, but other than that, I make um, all I do is make olas in different shapes, just depending on on what kind of style I want to make. So right now, since I'm doing this, um, I hardly use my tools. I I don't use my tools yet until until I really get finished with the coiling. And I always keep the, the top of the mouth wet because you, you know you don't want it to dry. And I'm using the traditional clay, you know, it kind of sets um quick. Um, especially like if the, you know it's really warm during the summer, some um, during the winter. Um, we have the fire going um, and we it stays warm in here in my in my house and in, in our house. And, um, it starts to um it starts to really set the, the party quick. Um, so when I have to um, grind more clay, I actually have to um I actually bring it inside and set it under the, the stove set it under the stove so it can dry and um, so I can grind the clay. Um, there's not really, there's not really a method where I, or what to do or how to dry it or, um, usually that's what I do is just set it in the fireplace and let it dry. So right now I put the first coil on there, so I'm putting on the second coil. And I know the time is gonna go by fast, so it's already been 15 minutes. But right now, um, when I told you that I, was, I used to make 20 pots a day, right now I'm down to five. down to five a day, um, I'm down to, <laughs> I'm probably down to one a day painting. Usually I get like three or four done. 
but right now it's just uh, just time consuming and what usually gets to me is my phone. <laughs> so um, we weren't raised with phones. <laughs> I wasn't raised with a phone. Um, but when right now, since I do have a phone, of course, there's Facebook, Instagram, whatever you want to look at. That's what gets to me. And I'm sitting here instead of painting or making pottery. <laughs> so I get in trouble, of course, all the time. I get yelled at and say like, well, what are you doing today? Or what did you do today? Uh, so I'll tend to say, well, I was making pottery and I painted it this much, but it's not really a lot. <laughs> the little one's always telling me all the time, say, oh, he was sitting there on his phone. <laughs> Putting on the second layer, this is uh, just the same as the first process. Um, just still working with my hands. You know, it doesn't have to be really perfect. Once it goes on there, it can be uneven. Um, it can have dents in there because you're still going to scrape, actually. So, you still have to mend did the mending process. So it's been 20 minutes, so I'm gonna move on. I did make a I did make another coil pot that I want to show you um, to take out to I guess to shape the pot. Um, this one I can't shape right now because you gotta let it set. And if you take it out too quick, um, it, it just flops over. And usually I don't, um, Usually I stay here with uh, dirty clothes and <laughs> I get really dirty. <laughs> I get really dirty and today it's uh, it's a good day, you know, I guess to, to show how to make pottery. So I'm really clean, but usually I get really dirty and when I want to, to make pottery. So this is how it comes out. I don't know if you can, can you see it? Okay, so this is the coil method. This is only two coils. So three coils will come out a little bit bigger, four coils. Um, but this is how the coil method, and you can see in the inside, it's still, see how it flops over, and but this is still wet, I mean, really wet. So once it sets, you can take it out. So I have one here that I built. And this one's set. So once it sets like this, um, I put it in a in another bowl, in a bowl with a rag in it. So once it sets, then you can take it out. So this is the process of when it does set. So what I do is I I just grab it, I push out, and I work from the top to the bottom. So when you work from the top to the bottom, when you get to the bottom part, you're not really taking out the bottom as much, but you're taking the top part out. Okay, so you can see the shape coming. I know a lot of you guys are get excited when you see the shape forming. Then sometimes you'll get a little bit of cracks in the on the outside. But those don't matter. You'll, you'll eventually get clay and patch them back up or just push the clay over. So this is how it looks when you put, take the top out. Okay. So once you did, once you do that, you're gonna take the bottom out, but you're not gonna overlap the, the bowl. Okay, so I don't overlap the bowl. Because once you overlap the bowl, what it does is 
it's going to cave in on you. Okay. So once you get to this stage, you you have to wait to take it out a little bit more. Okay, so I do have a lot of, a little bit of air bubbles in here. So what I do is I just take the knife and stab the air bubbles in the inside. But eventually, you know, they'll also get slapped down um, with the paddleboard. So that's the shape it's gonna take. So you already see the, see the shape of the Ola, Ola jump, okay. So what I do now is I take this tool. So once I get, take this tool, dip it in water, you're always using water. So you wanna grab it, push up, and I'm, all I'm doing is just cupping my hand. Pushing up. And you see how fast I work. I mean, I, I work fast. I'm getting old, but I try to work fast as much as I can. Um, I don't know how long I'll be doing pottery. <laughs> I've always said I, I wanted to, to work again, but at the same time, um, doing pottery, it, um, of course, it pays the bills. Um, let's just do whatever we want. but. Um, sometimes I, I get tired just sitting here or making pottery, sometimes painting. Painting is the, the one that really gets to me. Um, making is, is easy, piece of cake. <laughs> but painting is, the, painting is the one that really time consuming, um, you have to get your lines straight. Um, you mess up, you have to scrape. So I'll show you that here in a bit. Okay, so so this is the shape. And I know um, I taught a few classes um, up there at the uh, Culture Center. Um, I can't remember what the dates were, but I taught a few classes. Um, I taught adult classes, and I taught the children's class. And it was it's only for uh, tribal members. Um, so we try to keep the tradition within the, the reservation. Um, on how to make pottery. Um, and it, it's it's pretty nice to see the little kids, you know, get into the clay and say like, oh, this is how it feels. This, this is pretty cool. And when you show them, you know, the process of doing it, some of them get tired. <laughs> we had them go get their own clay. So this is how it's gonna come up. Okay, so we had them go get clay actually, and you have to walk. You can't, you don't drive up there. You, it's a walking, 
walk, a lot of walking back and forth. So what we do is we carry them in flower sacks, um, flower sacks or gunny sacks or um, five gallon buckets. Um, we have to hike them back to, to, um, to our vehicles. And a lot of the kids got tired and um, when they got tired, it was so funny that, um, you know, when they got back to the, um, to the coach center, they, they actually asked us, um, okay, so when are we going to make pottery? Can we make pottery now? But of course the process is, you know, you get it, you get the clay, you get the clay, you have to soak it down. Um, once you soak it down, you have to dry it out. Then once it dries, then you grind it, you sift it, and you add, um, once you sift it, you can add the water back in. Um, ring water is usually what everybody uses. Um, you add the ring water. Sometimes I boil my ring water to get it really hot. Um, um, when you boil the, the ring water, you pour hot water into clay and it, it really absorbs quickly. Um, then you get, after you mix your, your clay in a five gallon bucket or a pan, you get your pottery shards. Um, you ground up pottery shards, it's like a powder, and you add handfuls. I mean, I add a lot of um, pottery shards to my clay. Um, the reason why I add a lot of pottery shards is, is so when I build big pots like, like this in the back, when I build big pottery, this is um this is my roundup pottery shards. You see how it's powder forming. You can see the dust. So this is what I add, and I add a lot. And once I once I add a lot to it, the reason why I add it is because when you're building a, a big pot, it doesn't cake down in me. And this is what um what what holds it up. So once um the pottery shards I added um. um you know, you can actually make um, big pottery. Um, and a lot of it is just um, just how much you're gonna add in your clay. Um, it's not really measuring, you don't, we don't use a measuring cup or, or anything, you know, to measure the, the clay out. So <clears throat> after this is done, um, what I do is I cut the lip off and once I cut the lip off, I flip it back over. So I flip the pottery upside down and take the bowl off. And if I see a groove on it, if I see a groove on the bottom, what I do is I get the, uh, I get my tool again and I hold it on my lap and I twist it. I, um, I act, not twist it, I actually push it out on the butt part. So, when I do that, it dries, it sets. So this is how it's gonna set and see, it's still wet. So I can carry it, I can push it in because it's already set and this is ready to spray. So once I take it out and then let it set and let it dry a little, this is how it's gonna come out. So I pre-made this already, this pot. Let me see the shape of it. And compared to this shape too, see the shape of that? What this is gonna do, it's gonna look like this. And this is in, in the raw frame. So you can still see the line of the hoop you see on the bottom. Okay. So once that's done, and the reason why I said, you know, I don't really mind the cracks in it. I don't mind the dents because you're still gonna take your, Beef with, and what we do is we'll sit here and we scrape. Okay. So once you get this scrape, and right now these the pottery are heavy. Once you scrape the axis, play off it, it gets light. Okay. 
So this is the spacing process. So this is what I do, and um, this is the scraping process. Uh, once it's scraped and once it's all even, you see how you see a little bit of um, dent in there? So I keep scraping in order for it to get a little bit lighter. And then with the skull lids, what I do is I use it for the top of the lid. So that's what I use for the top of the lid. And then when I use the skull lid too, it's hard to hold because it's just a little thin line or a thin skull lid. So what I do is I hold it and I get all the grooves off even. And that's what makes my pottery so Um, that's what makes my pottery so, um, so even. So once I get that done, I'm going to put this back in the bag because it shows me the process of scraping. So this is the process of scraping. And thanks to Walmart, you know, I use a lot of their plastic bags. I don't throw them away. I use a lot of them to just cover my pots up with a Walmart bag. So after uh, I scrape, and this is my scrape. So my scrapes, I use over. All the scrapes that I do, I use over. So every piece of clay, every scrape, I use over. So, after it's scraped, this is what it's going to look like. Okay. So you see how it's really scraped and it's shiny and it's nice and even. So once I get it scraped like this, it's really light. Okay. I even scrape the bottom of it. So I just need to cut the lip. And what I do to cut the lip is I look at the uneven part, which is the thin area. So when I find a thin area, I get my knife and I just make it even as possible. I know you have to be really careful when you, when you cut your mouth because the pottery can easily crack when you push out. So you gotta go really, really slow. Okay, so there's your mouth part. So after I get that, what I do is I get the knife and I scrape in the inside of the mouth. Thank you. 
Okay. So after I scrape in the inside of the mouth, okay, that's that's even. So after I do that, what I do is um I get my rock and it's just a it's just a piece of rock that I I bought at the zoo. I mean, you can find different stones in the in the river beds. You can find stones here and there. Um, they of course they they're passed down. But these stones I found at the zoo and they're they're useful. So so what I do is I dip the rock in the in the water and I shine it back up. Okay. So I shine and get all the grooves off. And it's a lot of um, water using, so you use a lot of water. And I know you can see my uh, my water bowl. <laughs> I just grab different kind of bowls, whatever I can find in there in the kitchen. Sometimes I lose my bowl, and then I'll tend to get a different bowl. So I found this Valentine bowl that we got like probably like three or four years ago, and it was just sitting there. So I got it, and I ended up using that bowl. Um, water in it of course and and like I said I, I use boil water so when I put boil water in there of course I let it cool down I don't I don't dip my hands in boiling water but I let it cool down so all you're doing is just smoothing out with your hand I don't use anything else to smooth it I don't use a sponge I don't use you know, different things that people, other people use, but I just use my hand. So that's the top. Once I get the top, I flip it over. And they start shining the bottom part. And it's just an all-day process. Um, I sit here early in the morning. Sometimes, well, when I was uh, still young, which I am, but um, when I, I was younger, um, I would sit up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning painting pottery or making. And now I can't even stay up past 10 o'clock, <laughs> sometimes even 9 o'clock. I'm like, okay, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. So I go to bed early. Um, but I try to get pottery done as much as I can. Um, try to do the process of it and as best as I can that I know how. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. Um, it don't just happen in one day. It don't just happen in one year. Um, it takes time to master a piece of pottery. And, and it takes time to master you know, the perfection of how you're going to get the pottery to, to be in a perfect shape. So once I get this done, you see how it's nice and smooth from the water, just from the water and the rock shining. And it takes off a lot of the grooves. Okay, so that's the process of scraping, making, scraping, and shining the pot. Okay. So when that's done, this, it actually, after you finish doing that, you let it dry and this is what it comes out to. It comes out really light. So this is dry and this is a raw form. So you can see the inside, you can see the shape 
the thinness of the lip, and they're really thin and light. So every acma potter, every acma artist that does pottery, I mean, they make them really light. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people know that they are light, you know, and we're well known for, for the pots itself. Um, so after you get that done, when that's dry, this is what it comes out to. And this is the slip. Okay. No, this is uh this is slipped and this is designed, but I'm gonna show you. I know I only have uh 15 more minutes, but like I said, it's a process. So when I'm when I'm applying the slip, I have it in the in the old bowl, and this old bowl was made from actually rose chino, my auntie rose. Uh, when she passed away, uh, her daughter ended up giving me the bowl and telling me, you know, I can use it, you know, it, whatever, you know, and it had still a little bit of, um, a bit of uh, white slip in it. So I kept it as, using it as the white slip. So I, I, I usually use a, um, a sponge brush or I use a regular sponge and I just dip it in the, in the slip. And what I do is I just rub this all over the slip the, on the pot. Okay. And I do sections. I don't do the whole pot itself right away. Cause once you do the whole pot, um, you won't get as much as of a shine. And what I do is I just let it dry. Um, I don't do it when it's wet. Um, and the reason I don't do it when it's wet is because I don't let it, I don't want it to peel up, okay? So I get a, a rag and I just hand shine it. Okay, once I hand shine it, okay, I get my shining stone. And of course, like I said, I buy these at the Natural History Museum. I buy them at the zoo, and it's a, it's a heart shape. And it's just a polishing stone. Um, I, I really don't know where to find these polishing stones. I've never seen anything really quite shiny like this. Um, I've never found any shiny polishing stones wherever, you know, wherever I go, but I found them at the Natural History Museum. So when I shine, this is what I did. Okay. I know they're really thin, so you can hear that, the thinness of the pot. And so after I do that, you see the shine in it? I just get a rag and I wipe it back over, okay? So that's the shiny part, but look at this, it's the wrong part, okay? So I'm gonna set this down and then this is what it's gonna come up to. So I already have this design um, and I have my paint set out. You kind of move everything out of the way. Take a drink of water, of course. You always gotta keep hydrated when you're making pottery because you don't want to fall over or you don't want to make that mistake of, uh, of um, 
going to the hospital and then not making pottery again. <laughs> so I always get yelled at from my girls and say, Daddy, you need to drink water. Daddy, you need a, but it's, a, it's always water or a soda. And I love my Pepsi. So if you see me around, bring me some Pepsi. And of course I get yelled at when, when I do drink a lot of Pepsi. But I love my Pepsi. Uh, okay, so so I have all these set out. Um, these are my orange paints that I use. And I always have to keep them wet. Um, I don't really like to let them dry because I have to pour more water in there. And then usually I pour hot water. So when I boil the rainwater in, what I do is I just pour it back into the bowl um, just to let it just to let it set. And this is a darker orange. So when I do strain my orange, this is how it's gonna come out when it's dry. Okay, see how I get a knife and I end up scraping them into the into the bowl here. And I just scrape a little at a time. I don't pour to put the whole thing in there because it comes out to a lot. And this lasts forever. So I'm hoping you can see my paint. But this is my paint rock. And it, it's just huge. I mean, my paint rock is huge. My mother gave it to me. Um, my father and my mom weren't using it. Um, so I asked them if I can take it. So they said, yeah. And I was using a small one that I made, uh, me and my dad made. And when I started painting, I told him that I needed my own paint rock. So he said, okay. So I sit here most of the time making paint. I try to have my girls make it, but like I said, they have no patience at all um, to make paint, but they have patience to make. This is a uh, wild spinach, and of course we, well, of course the process is boiling it all the way down to the juice. We get it to juice form. Um, we get it to make um, like a candy form, and once we get it to make it like a candy form, we put it in corn husk and we roll it up. Now this time when I made some, what I did was I poured this on, what is that paper called? Um, parch paper. Oh. So I got the parch paper and I laid the wild spinach juice out of the candy, or whatever it's called, candy form. I laid it out and when I laid it out, I, I let it dry to where I can still roll it up. So I ended up laying every, all of it out. I got a cutter, a knife, and I ended up stripping them. So I rolled them up to rolls. And I, and I only got out of a big pot, I only got out of a whole truckload of spinach, wild spinach. Of course we got chased by cows, but out of a whole truck of spinach, we only got seven rolls of wild spinach. So seven, that's all we got out of a whole truck load. Okay, so I mix that into my paint. So I don't wanna mix any more because I already mixed it. So what I do is uh, my paint brushes aren't yucca. Um, I used to paint with yucca. My mom and dad always painted with yucca. They never painted with anything else. Um, one day I got tired of chewing and I got tired of making yucca brushes. Um, so what I did is I, when I had my girls, I ended up cutting their hair off and I ended up taking it to a stick. So I made a hairbrush. Okay, so I make hairbrushes for my girls pottery. I mean, my girls pottery, my girls hair. Um, so when I make um, paint brushes, I either make them a thin paintbrush or I make them a thick thick paintbrush, okay? And it, I, it, it works better for me. Um, I don't know if it works better for anybody else, but um, it works better for me to paint with. Um, my brothers and sisters do pottery also. They they use uh, hair brushes. Um, they make uh, traditional pottery. 
Um, some of them paint um, both commercial and traditional pots, but I stick I stuck with the traditional pottery. I don't do. I used to do commercial pottery a long time ago, but I just didn't get the feel of uh, how how it was and how you know you were painting them. So this is my process of of painting, and what I do is I just get the brush. And I line. And sometimes I'll add orange to it first. And when I add orange, I'll add the orange first because I don't really I don't like to go over and reline. But this is just showing you how I do line my pots. And it's all freehand. No ruler, no stencil, it's all freehand. And most of the ACMA pottery potters here, the ACMA artists, we all do freehand. No stencils. And that's not how we were raised. We were raised to, to paint our pottery like this. Okay. So I know we only have 10 minutes. I don't know if uh Lilia wants to cut in or 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 what, but yeah, I think it would be great if we could start doing a little bit of the QA right now, if that's okay with you. Robert. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Okay. We have a lot of fantastic questions that have come in. So thank you everybody right. for um being so engaged. And um, this has been a really spectacular presentation. Um Let's see. Okay. We have several questions about the slip that you use um, and what yeah. it's made out of. Um, the white slip is um, is made out of calcium. Um, it's um, it's dug out. It's just um, where we get it in in the mountain areas. Um, it's just a small thin layer of calcium which comes into the in in, in between the sandstone rock and um, just the the sand itself. And what, it, what we do is we go and we get a pick and we have to get it out, get it out. And they only come in little chunks. So once we, uh, once we get the little chunks out and see, you can still see a little bit of the, the parts that where it's white, but it's, it's nothing but sand and it's nothing but uh, like gravel and just different. I don't sift, I don't sift mine. Um, I don't sift the, the, the slip itself. I just put it in the hot water and use the way it, the way it is. So, so it, it's just calcium. That's all it is. We have several questions about the designs that you um, put on your pottery. Um, one huh? person is asking how you put the designs on the pots before painting and if you, how you um, make the intricate designs so even. Okay. Um, what I do is, um, of course, I get my. Um, uh, let me see. Of course, I get my um, prism pencil, and what I do is I. The reason why I use a prism pencil is because I can mark on here, and what what it does is it burns off. So once I get my lines, and. How I divide it is I put a cross on the bottom and I just line it. All I do is just use my, my own lining. I mean, I don't use a, a ruler. I just line it. I mean, it, it, it's as much years as I've been doing pottery, I mean, I'm just used to, to doing that. And um, of course I can't see what I'm doing, but... <laughs> So that's why I have the reading glasses. So when I put the reading glasses on, of course I can see, you know, as much as I possibly as I can, but I just do the lining and then, and then once I get my four sides, so once I get my four sides, I, I actually put the design in there and I don't design the whole thing with the pencil. I just try to get the main parts of the lines where I'm gonna paint. So once I get that done, um, so I'm going to show you a piece I finished last night. 
this is how it this is how it's gonna look. Okay, so this is a finished top, and you see how even it is, and you see the four sections from the bottom too. Okay, and then you see the four sections on the top. So it's just four. Now I can go sixteen. I can go sixteen sides. I can go. Um, just as long as I get an even count amount of squares or even an even amount of uh, sections. So this is a finished pop. The reason why it's brown is because adding a lot of the, the river rock and the spinach juice, it'll actually turn dark brown to black, okay? The more uh, spinach, um, wild spinach juice you add, the more black it's gonna get, okay? but you don't want to add too much because your paint will peel. Okay, so this is one that I finished. That piece is spectacular. Oh my gosh. Thank wow. you. Wow, so we are about out of time here. We have a lot of questions that we unfortunately don't have time to get to, but Robert, hopefully we can have you back in the near future and we can answer a lot of these other questions. And I would like to end um, by sharing a comment that has come in um, from Dylan Henry saying, this has been a wonderful demonstration. I'm so grateful to Mr. Patricio for the careful planning and preparations that helped us understand the process. I almost cannot believe he was able to show all of all of this in under one hour. He's a gifted artist. <laughs> and I would have to all right, thank you. <laughs> I would have to agree. This has been spectacular. Um, I so appreciate you taking the time to spend your morning with the Museum of Indian sure. Culture. I, mean, I can take a couple of questions. I mean, I don't mind getting off um, like five minutes later. So actually you know, one in particular that I really wanted to get to. So um, why don't we just take this one briefly? So what are some words of advice to the younger generation who may be interested in traditional pottery or reviving historical st styles in their communities? Um, okay, well, Words of advice, um, you must have a lot of patience. Um, you must have a lot of time on hand and work from your heart. So every, every pot you, you're gonna do, you know, you wanna take time, you wanna have that prayer inside your, your heart. You know, you wanna put your, your whole heart to, to what you wanna make, um, what you wanna do, what you wanna make, um, you know, if it's uh, traditional pottery or if it's painting, you know, put your whole heart into it. So that's uh, kind of, you know, my thing to the younger generation. Um, a lot of patience. <laughs> that's wonderful advice. Um, let's see here. In that same vein, um, we have a question asking about the um, importance of, quote, stories, songs, and prayers in your process of pottery making. The stories that I give, you know, sometimes, you know, those are the ones that are brought up, um, you know, within my family, within my mother, my, my, my father, my grandma, my aunts, um, you know, sometimes they tell you different um, prayers, you know, to do. So what I do in the morning is when I get up, you know, I go outside and I go pray or when I start making pottery, I do a, a little prayer. And I ask for that guidance, you know, from, from my elders. Um, and it, it is very important, you know, that you do that, you know, once you, once you get your, started with your clay, once you go after your clay, once you start doing the process of making traditional um, pottery and making traditional paint, you know, you always have to ask for that guidance. It's important that you do because, you know, you never know what you're going to get out of it. You never know if it's going to come out um, correctly, if it's going to break, if it's going to crack. You know, those are those are some of the things that um, you know you gotta you gotta do. That's that's the importance of it. The very important of, of what you have to do for prayer. Okay. Wonderful. So to actually wrap it up this time, um, we have several people who are interested in purchasing your work. So can you um, just give us a little bit um, about where we can find your work? Um, right now, um, you can find my work in the Santa Fe Galleries. You got um, King's Gallery. Uh, he has two shops in Scotts, one in Scottsdale, one in Santa Fe. Um, he's uh, he's the one that purchases a lot of my pottery, a lot of my work. So you can find my stuff there. Um, another gallery is Pablo of that's 
Pottery of the Southwest. Um, you can find my pottery is also there. Um, you can find some of my daughter's work there. Um, I encourage you to get some of my daughter's work because my daughters are getting probably, I'm gonna say more better than I am. <laughs> So as they grow up, you know, their, their work is going to be valued. Um, so th that's part of the main places you can get. Or if you, if you like um, to shoot me an email and you say, you know, I want to purchase a pottery from, from you, um, I usually do it that way. So Yes. And um, anybody who's also interested in purchasing can email me. Um, my email address was in the confirmation for um, this program and I can send it over to Robert. Yeah, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. Again, thank you okay. Robert, for spending your morning with us. Um, this has been completely spectacular. And right. um, be watching as always um, a recording of this program will be made <laughs> available on YouTube in the coming weeks. So keep an eye out for that. And yeah, well, thank you. I like to I like to thank you, uh, Lilia, for um, for getting this demo together. Um, I know it's a it's a struggle, and I know for me it's a struggle. You know, I try to get everything prepared for the demo, but um, you know, I like to thank everybody that participated um, to the Zoom, and um, may all your prayers be answered, and may you have all a wonderful day, a wonderful week, a wonderful year, and time of your life. So we'll see you back.